Facebook Live Ask the Doctor, and we have, uh, this is the series we call Ask the Orthopedic Doctor. And I'm Jeremy Rodrigo, your Director of Business Development here at Waterbury Hospital. And I'm very pleased today to have with me Dr. Charles Raftery, and he is with, a, with the Connecticut Spine and Disc Institute. His office is in Middlebury at 1579 Street Turnpike, and he does his surgeries right here at Waterbury Hospital. Dr. Raftery, thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Um, so, as we do with all the doctors that we bring on, we ask you a little bit about your um, about your practice and where you came from and where your training and stuff like that. So, how long have you been practicing medicine here in the Waterbury area? In Waterbury, probably 17 years. 17 years. Mm -hmm. And where did you get your training? Where did you come from? How'd you land here, I guess? So, well, starting way back, I was born on Long Island, so not too far from here. Um, went to medical school in Pittsburgh and then did my residency and a spine fellowship, which is additional training after the, uh, the residency, and I did that at NYU in Manhattan. NYU. And then, and then somehow you landed, landed here in Waterbury. Yeah, I, I came about this in a, a long route. I went out to Washington State initially um, because I wanted to see what I could do on my own and not have a safety net of people around me. Yeah. Um, did well there, but the weather, it rains a lot in Washington. So I came back east closer to my family and went initially to New Hampshire uh, at a, just a spine institute. Yeah. Um, and I learned more there, but those doctors, I don't like doctors who are arrogant, and those doctors were very arrogant. So I left there um, and came to Waterbury. You like Waterbury, because we keep it real in Waterbury. You keep it real, right? that's right. There's, like I say this all the time about Waterbury, there's good people here. Um, everyone knows each other. We're a very tight-knit community. Um, so you know all the other doctors in the area, right? Uh, um, and you you're pretty much on your own. You have your own on my own, but yeah. you know all the, the uh, other I, guys. Yeah, I know and work with all the other all the other guys. Uh, guys, right? So today we're going to talk about um, spine and disc and things like that. Although you do all kinds of orthopedic injury, I do orthopedic injury. I know how to do for my training other things like joint replacements, but. Personally, I'm not good enough to do it. So if a person wants me to do it, I refer them to someone who I think yeah. is, is has that skill to give a good, really good outcome. And that's what we want, right? We right. want our patients to be well cared for. So, but in uh, in contrast, your other colleagues will refer people to you uh, mm -hmm. when it's spine and yes. disc and things like that. So the name of your practice is the Connecticut Spine and Disc Institute. So tell us a little bit about some of the injuries or some of the conditions that you take care of, and you have some props here, if you want yes. to use those, that you take care of at your office. So uh, a lot of what we see regarding spine is not specifically trauma related, although you could say a lumbar sprain or a contusion, meaning a bruise, could be sort of trauma related. The majority <coughs> actually of things are wear and tear or arthritis related. Um, and when we look at arthritis in the spine, th this is a model of the lumbar spine. We talk primarily about the where the joint between the two bones occurs. And there's a disc, so the square blocks are the bones. The discs are, are the sort of cushion in between the bones. And then in the back, so your back is along here, there are what we call facet joints. And as the disc wears out, the facet joints will start to wear out. When they wear out, they typically cause bone spurs. So people could have back pain from the wear and tear, and they could also develop leg pain if a bone spur were to push on a, on a nerve. And this nerve would feed down into the leg in that Correct, clock. and this is a model of the neck. The nerves that come out here go into your arms. Okay, so how do you make the correction? So what does it look like when you have someone who's got an issue with a disc or the bone? What does the correction look like when, you, when they come into surgery? Or let's back up. Somebody comes into your office and they have pain, mm -hmm. leg pain, back pain or whatever. What's the first thing you do? At what point do you arrive at surgery? So my job, and my patients know this very well, I talk about different options. And we have to remember that each option has advantages and disadvantages. So at the, at the end of the day, there's no perfect one-size-fits-all answer. Mm -hmm. And I try to have people choose an answer that they think is right for them. Sometimes we consider something like doing a cortisone injection. But if a patient hates needles, and there are certainly people that hate that, that isn't the right answer for them. Right. I talk about things like physical therapy. I talk about chiropractic treatment. I talk about acupuncture. I don't understand some of that stuff, but the way I look at it makes it very simple to, to uh, sort of uh, process. I look at what's the risk compared to a surgery. Mm -hmm. So the risk of acupuncture is clearly lower than the risk of surgery. And I also look at what's a reasonable time frame for it to work. I usually use one month. 
And I think that's true whether it's physical therapy, chiropractic treatment, or acupuncture. I think a one-month trial is reasonable. Mm -hmm. The only advantage that physical therapy has over every other answer is it teaches the patient how to treat themselves. And if we look at these things like arthritis, there's no cure for arthritis. The real goal is to maintain the symptoms at a manageable level. But going to physical therapy, when that helps, the person's in a way learned how to treat themselves. Right. So they're not dependent on someone else for help. Right, and they can learn techniques that they can continue to do at home. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And they can continue And they, to they should strong. do it at home. They should continue on a home exercise program. But life sometimes is busy, and I get it when people say, I'll do it later. As we all know, sometimes later never mm -hmm. comes. Right. But at least they know what to do to get the symptoms back under control if they start to escalate. So they've gone through, they've listened to your suggestions, whether it be acupuncture or um, uh, chiropractic or physical therapy, it doesn't relieve the symptoms. You did some cortisone, cortisone shots perhaps and that helped for a little bit. At what point do you arrive and say, you know, this may be, you may be a good candidate for surgery, here's all the pros and cons and here's how we're gonna go forward. I think that's a good question, but I arrive at that uh, acknowledgement with the patient. It's okay. not some, I don't tell people or hardly ever suggest or strongly suggest surgery as the answer. Yeah. Keep in mind, just like all the other answers, surgery doesn't make things normal. It's not normal to have, sometimes we put metal rods and, and screws. It's, that stuff doesn't make it normal. It's still trying to make really bad to not so bad. So in a way, the patient has to decide if their symptoms for them are bad enough to justify <coughs> the risk of whatever's being done. Surgery, of course, has higher risk than all the other options. Yeah. I like that. Be I like the way that you phrase that, which is yeah, it could be because you're a surgeon, right? You're a surgeon, True. but that doesn't mean that you're going to surgery. Well, unfortunately, especially in the world of spine, I find that fear, some doctors use fear to get the patients to do what they want. And I, I think that's not right. Right. So you're, you're going to explain to them the risks, the benefits, all the, the pros and the cons, everything to do with surgery and say, if this is, sounds good to you, then we'll go forward and here's what you can expect. So how Correct. So I think one of the reasons to get a good outcome or one of the ways is you need a, you need to know what the problem is that you're treating. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because some things show up on a picture, say an x-ray, that may not be causing your symptoms. So one of the important things is to try to identify as best you can what the source for the symptoms is. Then you can take a step back and look and say what options for this location or this source are most appropriate. So you need to know the source for the symptoms um, and ideally you need to have a simple answer for the procedure. So with back pain, um, sometimes we do a fusion. So a fusion for back pain, a decompression for leg pain. But in my experience, the more levels that you include, the worse the outcome is. And patients may not want to hear it, but I think it's the right thing to say, look, your problem, surgery's not going to be worth it for the levels that are involved in your particular case. And so, that might be a hard pill to swallow, but it's an honest pill. Yeah, and you want to be honest with your patients because do. you don't want them to have some expectation that you're going to put them under, cut them open, do a bunch of fancy stuff, and then they come out and it didn't maybe have the anticipated effect, right? Well, that's why I mentioned before, I tell people it's not gonna make your back normal, we're trying to make it manageable. So you're right. bringing something that they can't live with to something that they can live they with. They can live with. Right. Because, and that's the other thing, you didn't cause their back pain or ailment or whatever, you're trying to just make it manageable so they can live as normal a life as possible. Right. And for me, it's, it's even more important because I work alone. I don't have a place to hide. <laughs> right. I have a bad outcome. They come to me. And they I come to that. you. Right. They come to you. So tell me about, I'm going to grab your prop here. So tell me about when you're going to do a surgery and for ha maybe you're going to do a repair of a disc. What does that so look like? That's a good question, but we don't actually repair discs. So, so if, a person has, you now, if a person has a disc herniation and it's pushing on a nerve and they have leg pain that matches that nerve pattern, what we do is we actually go in, a fairly simple procedure, go in, move the nerve over and clean out what's pushing on the nerve. Okay. We don't have a way, we can't stuff the disc material back in and say stitch it in place and have it work. That, that wouldn't that be work. effective. So the best we can do is take the pressure off the nerve to help with the leg symptoms. But that doesn't make the disc normal. It's taking the pressure off of the nerve okay. to reduce or sometimes eliminate the symptoms. That's interesting. So when you do have to add like an appliance, like a, a piece of metal or a rod right. or screw, what does that look like? 
So I mentioned the decompression typically for leg pain, and it's, it's maybe taking out a piece of disc material pushing on the nerve. It may be shaving out bone spurs that are pushing on the nerve. That's the decompression. When we treat back pain, typically we're talking about a fusion. Basically, a fusion is taking two or more bones and sort of welding them or fusing them into one bone. And it may be a primitive logic, but the logic is if the arthritis motion is causing the pain, if you stop the motion, theoretically you stop the pain. But like I tell my patients, you may cause new pain in the process. So a fusion is actually taking two bones and... Two or more. Two right. or more. Right. And putting them together, and they're not supposed to be that way, right? They're supposed Correct. to be apart and free, moving, moving freely. Right. So one of the big problems with a fusion, whether it's for your neck or your low back, when you take away the discs that are working, the other discs have to work harder. And that may lead them to wear out faster than they would have otherwise. So I tell patients, having surgery now doesn't necessarily mean you will not have another surgery in the future. That's really The future you kind of don't know, and you have to look at the now and say, right now, what are my options, and can I live with what I have or take the risk? Are there people who experience back pain or are there common back ailments or leg or whatever that are more common for certain types of people? Uh, that's a good question. Um, interestingly, and it's not so much the case anymore, tr truck drivers would have an increased risk of disc herniations. And it's thought that the reason why is the old trucks, before they had better seating and stuff, they had a vibration that was yeah. just perfect to cause disc herniations. Really? Yeah. And so that ergonomics have improved that in the oh yeah the seating now they have the air ride seats yeah. which absorb a lot of the vibration i think the engines are getting better so they don't have that you know that diesel yeah right right the, the, right, the, the, the rattle right, right the vibration and are there other types of is it you know people who work uh manual labor or is it sports or what that so yeah i think there are several different things i think heavy physical labor um, the more, in a way, the more you beat up your spine, the more problems you may have. So that's one thing. But also sedentary people, people who have a desk job who don't get up and move around intermittently. I don't think our spines were meant to sit in one place. I don't think our bodies were meant to sit in one place for eight hours at a time. It's not normal. Right, so getting up and moving, moving around. around. Right. And then also um, standing. When people have back pain with standing, what I suggest, a pretty simple thing, is put a little stool where you're standing and put one foot up on the stool. And what that does is it shifts your pelvis a little bit, which then will shift your spine a little bit ah. and can reduce the symptoms. And then I, have, I suggest people alternate their feet. No kidding. The other thing you could do is if you're at the kitchen sink, which sometimes people have increasing pain when they're at the sink, say, I doing dishes. So open up the cupboard underneath, you know, the cabinet, yeah. put one foot inside and switch from time to time. That is a re that's a cool tip. Oh, thank because you. Because sometimes when I'm doing the dishes, yes, honey, I do the dishes sometimes, if my wife is watching. <laughs> um, but, you know... The, the other thing I tell do, people is, if that's a problem, and you're looking at a decision between having a fusion surgery or eat off paper plates, then you don't have to do right. the dishes, paper right? Paper plates! Paper plates! This guy's a genius! Yeah. This, so, let's. One of the things I like to do when I when I go through this is, when someone wa people fear going to specialists, especially surgeons, because especially they, spine surgeons, especially right. Yes. And so, how do you allay those fears? What can people expect if they've either co contacted you directly or they've been referred to by their primary care physician? How do you allay that? What can they expect when they walk into the Connecticut Spine and Disc Institute and they greet the receptionist and then they're going to go see Dr. Raftery? What can they expect? They can expect a discussion almost exactly like we're having now. It's low key. I use a little bit of humor when I can and sort of help guide them to an answer that's right for them. So it's not. No, it's not. It, the other thing I find is I like to use pictures. So what I do is I go into the office very early, usually 5 o'clock in the morning, print out whatever pictures were taken, MRI, CT scan, x-rays, so I have it when the patient's ready to come in. Because I, I personally hate wasting a patient's time. That's, that shouldn't be. So once the pictures are there, I use the pictures and the models to explain things. And I think when people know better what the situation is, they can address it better. Right, so you're laying it all, you're not, you don't take the posture of, I'm the doctor, I'm going to tell you what's best for you. Not at all. You'll listen, and you'll just cooperate and do as I say. You're going to say, here's everything I know about you. Yes. Here's what you've explained. Maybe we'll talk further about your symptoms or pain or this and that, and we'll create 
a plan yes. that works for you. And also the reverse makes me really uncomfortable. If a patient says, you're the doctor, you tell me what to do. Yeah, you don't I, like I, it. I can't do that. No, no. because you, you don't have to live with the... Well, the other thing patients say, what would you do if, if you had this? And I say, typically I say, I understand that question, but I'm not you and I, I can't possibly be you, so I can't possibly answer. Plus, if I've never had those symptoms, how do I know what I would do? Right. You only know when you're in that situation. So now we get to a point where your um, the patient has elected to go to surgery. You've agreed with that, and then they come in, and the next time they see you is in typically two weeks after the surgery. Two, right. After the surgery. So, we all do our surgeries differently. I use absorbable stitches so nothing needs to come out. And I put a waterproof dressing on there. And I just leave that on for two weeks. And I find that if people have to do dressing changes and it starts to look funny, someone else comes over and pokes the incision. Yeah. Before you know it, you get an infection. I haven't had a spine infection in ages. It, that's, see, ages. that's great to know. I just leave the dressing on and they can take a shower, a quick shower because it's waterproof. But just leave it there. We'll take it off in two weeks. So. That's awesome. So you, you bring them in, you do the surgery, they get discharged. How quickly after someone is discharged from the hospital or from wherever the surgery was done, can they get up and start to move around and do the physical therapy? How? Pretty much right away. Right away. Yeah. Yeah. I have people avoid lifting more than about 10 pounds after a disc surgery. Yeah. Because for the first four weeks after, the opening where the disc has come out has to heal. And that's what takes about four weeks. So if you lift too heavy or sit too long, more disc material could pop out and you could have what we call a recurrent disc herniation. Yeah, we don't want that. No. So if you have someone come in and they, you've done your surgery, it can get back to normal pretty quick. I mean, as long as they're not abusing themselves. Right, right. so disc surgery, lumbar disc surgery, the recovery typically uh, maybe four to six weeks before things are pretty much back to normal. Back to normal. Um, fusion surgeries though typically it's six to twelve weeks so sometimes up to three months and sometimes longer depending on the patient. Neck surgeries with what, what I do typically it's between four and ten weeks before everything's back to normal. So a question that I did get is when someone starts to experience numbness and tingling mm -hmm. in their upper extremities is that usually something to do with their cervical spine? That's a good question. But I don't ass I don't make assumptions like that. Yeah. So he here's what I explain to patients. If we had a picture of your neck, if we had an MRI of your neck, remember something there doesn't prove that it's causing your symptoms. What else could we do? You could get a nerve conduction study, which is not looking at a location, it's looking at a structure in a way. Okay. So remember you could have a finding here but really have a problem say in your shoulder or you could have carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay. Um, the way I approach things is if a person does have two separate problems, we sometimes call that double crush. Say they have a disc herniation in their neck and they have carpal tunnel. I actually suggest they get this done first because this is an easier recovery and it's a lower okay. risk approach. So if you have two different procedures and as an estimate each one can help you 50%, pick the low risk simple fast recovery first before picking the other one. Interesting. So that's really interesting. So you're you're really just trying to look at all the pieces of the puzzle and Absolutely. see what makes the most sense right now for the patient. We decide that though. It's you, not like I you tell and the people, patient just, make right, that decision, right. can, taking into consider their lifestyle and their schedule and everything right. else and their their level of risk, what risk they're willing to take. Um, it's all it's all crucial to coming up with a, an individual plan for each particular patient. Excellent. So, let, somebody comes into the operating room. How long are they under in the operating room when you're doing it? Depends on the procedure. If we're just doing a decompression, and if it's just one level, one side, that takes anywhere between 45 minutes to maybe an hour. Forty That's done as an outpatient, so you go home the same day. Oh, no kidding. Mm -hmm. So you come in, and you can have spine surgery and be home that night. Yes. There's another procedure that I also do for spinal compression fractures, which typically occurs with when people have osteoporosis or thinning of the bone. What I can do is go inside a particular bone, uh, put in a little balloon, expand the, bo the balloon to try to reshape the bone, take the balloon out and put bone cement in. That takes about 20 minutes to do, also done as so an operation. So you're putting bone cement in, you're actually building back bone that was lost? Yes. And, that, and the recovery and is? There's no recovery from that. Wow. Because it's done through one or two little poke holes at each level. 
That is so cool. So when it, it's some surgeries we do, people are worse the day or two after. Yeah. Um, this is not one of those procedures. You're either better right away within 24 hours. But remember, not everything works for everyone. So the proceed, not everyone gets better from that. I got you. About in my hands, about 85 percent of people get better. That's excellent. Um, one of the other things that you do, like many of the uh, orthopedic physicians that we speak to, is you do trauma. Call. Yes. So sometimes you're on the weekend, you're at the barbecue, <laughs> you get a call from the emergency department here. I won't answer it. Ambu just, kid <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Am ambulance just brought somebody in from a motorcycle accident or fall off a ladder or something. Right. They may see. You, the, the trauma team is taking care of the patient here. You, they may call you in. Yes, absolutely. And so at what point did you do you decide I'm going to take care of this issue right away or the patient needs more stabilization or whatever and then maybe I'll come back in a day or two and do the surgery the patient is safe to wait how do you make that call a lot of it is based on our training and our comfort level so some things I don't feel comfortable treating and just because I sort of know how to do it doesn't mean I should do it mm -hmm. so in those cases fortunately we have a, a large a pool of talent here that I can call up and ask someone who I think is really good at that aspect if they can take over care. Mm -hmm. But if it is something that you'll take care of here, mm -hmm. how do you decide whether you're going to take care of it right now? The accident happened an hour ago, trauma team took care of them, they called you in, you had the barbecue on, mm -hmm. apron on. I still, still have the sauce on. You still have barbecue sauce on you. <laughs> Licking my fingers. And you're <laughs> like, let's go, let's go to town. Um, so that for me that has several factors. One is the time of day that we're considering doing it. Mm -hmm. If something can wait a bit, I think it makes more sense to do it during day because there's a big whole hospital staff. In right. case we need something or something goes bad, I want as many people there to help out as possible. Um, some things we can't wait that long, so if it's an open, what we call an open fracture, where bone is exposed, um, typically we do, do those things sooner, so I may not be able to put it off till daylight. I may have to do it at night. And and Waterbury Haas here, Waterbury Hospital, you know, we're 24-7, right? right? So it could happen any time, day or night. Anytime. You'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things. You know, people think it's easy being a doctor. Well, maybe I don't know if they do. But, <laughs> but when you get called in in the middle of the night, you got to be on your game. You have to be on your game. But also think about this. When I'm on call, I can't go to the movies. I might get called. Right. I can't go out to dinner because I might get called. I... I can't get a haircut because I might get called. And when you're called, you're expected to be there within 30 minutes. So I can't travel. I'm sort of confined to this area yeah. and restrict my activities. You're on like home confinement, I, like without the ankle bracelet. Right. Well, I may wear an ankle bracelet. Right. Anyway. right? Because <laughs> you'll like you'll get called at Dr. After you have to come in and Dr. After has to come in. Absolutely. And a few times I was actually, I do a lot of yard work and stuff outside. I was cutting my grass and didn't hear the phone because of the mower. Yeah. So like an hour later, I got a second phone call. They said, where are you? Well, I'm cutting the grass. Why? <laughs> so you, now I even restrict that. I don't do anything where I'm going to be dirty, you know, working with my hands. Right. In the garden because if I get called in right you want to present your you don't want the right. patient looking at you say who is this who's man? the farmer <laughs> who's the, the farmer, farmer? <laughs> oh no he's gonna fix your spine <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's gonna be great so we're almost done we're almost out of time um, dr. after is there anything else that you wanted to that you think is important to share with your patients or potential patients before we go um, well we touched on I do the low back stuff I do cervical spine or neck stuff um, I also do mid back problems, what we call thoracic spine, but those conditions are not as frequent as lumbar or low back or neck. Okay. So I do that area as well. Um, I also do different injections, and one of the ideas of the injections is not only to help the patient, but to prove where the pain is coming from. So as an example, if I do, say, an injection by this nerve and it doesn't help, and I do an injection by this nerve and it does help, then I know this nerve is the source and I also know to leave this nerve alone. So the nerve conductions, the uh, uh, nerve blocks can help us better prove the location. And remember early on I said a good outcome, part of it you need to prove as best you can the source for the symptoms right. before considering any aggressive treatment. Excellent. So if you have issues, spine issues, back issues, pain, numbness, tingling, things like that, and you think that it's important to see uh, someone who specializes in this, Dr. Charles Raftery is from the Connecticut Spine and Disc Institute. He does surgery right here at Waterbury Hospital. He's located in Middlebury. His number is 
1-800-242-2003. His office is at 1579 Straits Turnpike, right over in Middlebury. Um, you will also see him wandering around the halls here, taking care of patients and uh, doing surgery here. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. We appreciate it. Again, for next time, this is the last in the series um, until we resume the series in the fall. So we're going to resume the series of Ask the, Ask the Doctor in fall right here at Waterbury Health. Thanks. Take care. Have a good night.